Well, good afternoon. If you are in places such as New York and Martha's Vineyard, good morning or just afternoon if you're in New Orleans. Good evening if you might be in Dakar or Paris or Oxford or any number of the places where my wonderful guest today has frequented and, and told the world about, but we'll get to that in a moment. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. I'm Fred Plotkin, and as regular visitors to this place know, I invite people, I try to, who inspire me. And yes, I've done about 90 of these programs now, but I could say with no hesitation, I'm getting goosebumps as I say it, one of the very most inspiring of all is joining me today, Dr. Jessica B. Harris, scholar, author, friend of mine, one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the Year 2021. I will read what they published in Time Magazine. It was written by Carla Hall. For me, the work that Jessica B. Harris has done has given me a deeper sense of who I am as an African-American and why I should be proud to be an African-American. It's one thing to have Black history, but she has the ability to relay information from the perspective of the culture, looking at our food and what our ancestors have eaten, our DNA on a plate. She has a way of sharing things that have happened in our culture, whether in Senegal, other West African countries, or the United States, and giving you a sense of pride because of the knowledge that she has. Her critical thinking helps you to question the things that you're told or things that you think are true. Eating is something that we all have to do every day, and she has had a huge influence on the way we eat. Through work like her best-selling book, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America, and the 2021 Netflix series it inspired, Jessica makes food more approachable. It's not intimidating. It's very much accessible. And she gives you the confidence to make a dish. I think that Jessica's voice is necessary, not just in this very small and intimate industry, but on a bigger stage. That's by Carla Hall. Now... Um, I want listeners to know today, because um, often the topics that we cover here are musical related, though not only, that I know Jessica through our food writing work, but I also know Jessica deeply through our shared love of music. And this goes back as far as does our food work, wouldn't you say, Jessica? I absolutely agree with that. Yes. Good afternoon, Fred. Thank you. And it's, I want to start, I think, with one thing. Uh, you've written many wonderful books. The first Jessica Harris book I knew before I met you was called Sky Juice and Flying Fish. Um, and it's a wonderful book. It's from the beginning, I would say, of your food writing career, toward the beginning. And you also uh, recently wrote a memoir. Would you talk about that book? The memoir. Yep. Oh, oh my. Well, it's called My Soul Looks Back, which is again a musical reference because it comes from an African American song, a Negro spiritual. Um, well, how I, I got into my knowledge, sorry to interrupt. I thought it was written by Clara Ward. Oh, you you're right. Yeah. You are right. You're right. But it it's certainly in the genre, if you will, of spirituals. But I think the thing, the thing about it and the thing that's interesting, and I have never actually looked at the sheet music, is that there seem to be two different interpretations of it. How I got over, how I got over. One interpretation is my soul looks back in wonder how I got over. And another interpretation, which is one that I hear from many of my African-American friends, which may speak to our sort of look at life, my soul looks back and wonders how I got over it. Very different meanings, but the same incredible song. 
And so um, My Soul Looks Back is the title of the memoir that really looks at a time when I was somewhere between, I guess, probably 23 and 35. And that, I mean, that song is profoundly inspiring to me. It has been for, for, I can tell you exactly when I first heard it, I'll tell you in a moment, but I too have heard it with different lyrics and not just the in and the end, but also other lyrics that I want to talk to you about in a moment. Okay. But the, how I got over, I've heard as a, as a song of motivation, but I've also seen it at funerals. For example, Shirley Caesar, wonderful gospel singer and preacher, Absolutely. sang it at Aretha Franklin's funeral. So it was kind of like, her completion and as Aretha got over to the next place mm -hmm. that um, how I got over Shirley Caesar turned it into a narrative of Aretha Franklin's life. I can Whereas believe that. She's so Aretha great at that. It, yeah. When Aretha sang it, it was not about the end. It was about how I am the, the woman standing here in front of you today. And by the way, Jessica, when I invited you for today, I did not realize I, I later realized uh, I'm what's called an aretheologist. And oh I, no! I remembered that January 14th stuck in my head for some reason. It turns out that 50 years ago today, Aretha did the second day of recording of her famous gospel album, which is the most famous and best-selling gospel album of all time, in which she sang "How I Got Over." Oh among goodness! The songs. Well, if I've so, fallen in with a arethologist or arethologist, <laughs> um, I'm in danger waters because I just I just love her and listen, but I don't know that I know much information. But well, um, she's really I. Uh, let me tell you how I first heard this song, how I got over because when your book came out, I thought, okay, that's a wonderful title, and you know, it's the Jessica I know even before I read the book. It was the Jessica I know. I can tell you the date because I, I fix on dates. August 28th, 1963 happened to be the March on Washington where Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. My mother took me. I was a little boy and she just thought it was very important that I be present for this event. And I certainly remember the image of Dr. King and the stirring of the crowd. But what really grabbed me was Mahalia Jackson, who I'd never mm -hmm. heard of before. Mm -hmm. And she sang How I Got Over. And a particular lyric jumped out at me. I want to thank God for giving me a vision. And the most important word in there was actually the A, the, a, the uh, for giving me a vision, as opposed to giving me vision. I was seven because as a seven-year-old child, yes, I understand seeing eyesight vision but i want to thank god for giving me a vision just opened up worlds to me and mm. when i learned the song i began to sing it in the mahalia way which is to say i want to thank god for giving me a vision when i later really studied the song more i learned that clara ward had written it maybe 20 years before not even and her original lyric was, I want to thank him for heavenly vision. Mm. And while I embraced the Clara Ward form and, and Marion Williams sang it that way and Aretha sang it that way, it was when Mahalia changed it. I want to thank God for giving me a vision that she was encapsulating what Dr. King was saying, but she was encapsulating it in musical terms. And... um. That was the day, I think, when I understood how music and lyrics and music could be a vessel for emotion and for ideas and for growth. I couldn't put all that into words the way I did now, but something grabbed me about I want to thank God for giving me a vision that catapulted me forward in my life. And I remember it vividly. So when your book came out, I just thought amen to that. Well, I think the thing that's so interesting about your approach to it and, and your recall, your very clear recall of it, is that it also speaks to the improvisational nature of gospel music, that we, 
you know, we're all very good about, you know, gospel, about jazz being improvisational. But the idea of gospel being improvisational is probably less discussed, maybe not less witnessed, but less discussed. And I think that's one of the things specifically that's so fascinating about it. I don't know if you saw the recent film Summer of Soul. Oh, yes. <laughs> with that incredible <laughs> duet um, that is just, you know, hair standing on end yeah. magnificent. But the whole idea of um, of Mahalia Jackson, Haley, apparently, as she called herself, who is from New Orleans, um, she is apparently also the one that exhorted uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Tell him about your dream. Tell him In about Detroit. the dream. So there is absolutely that whole segue from a vision to the dream that's part of that improvisation as well. That's just extraordinary that, you know, it's that, that thing that, that carries us through. He did this sort of trial run of that talk a few weeks before in Detroit to see which notes really struck and which words really chimed in. And yes, you're right. Mahalia was the one who moved him forward. When he was very down, he would call her up in Chicago usually and ask her to sing to him on the telephone, usually mm -hmm. Precious Lord by Thomas A. Dorsey, who is the father of gospel music in a way. And um, that's what she sang at his funeral. Mm. Oh, which my Atlanta. mother used to sing yeah. in the kitchen, you know. Yeah, I, I know. So um, did you grow up, what kind of music did you grow up with? Oh, goodness. I grew up with everything. I grew up with absolutely everything. I am a musical omnivore, if you will. I um, I had piano lessons as, as a young child. In fact, um, my mother, by the time I was, oh gosh, I'm not even sure. Um, well, let me backstroke. My mother is a Baptist minister's daughter. Uh, I was raised Presbyterian, so I didn't grow up in a gospel tradition. But my mother was always very, very, very much involved in music. And in her home, there was a piano. I have in my house right now the baby grand, Aeolian baby grand piano mm -hmm. that my mother bought when my father was off at World War II. And she took piano lessons and played, not well, but competently. Um, and um, the piano was always a part of it. My father played somewhat by ear and loved loud, crashing chords. So he would, you know, play three or four things that he played by ear, and that was it. But they were all dramatic, to say the least. Um, in the course of her work career, my mother became the administrative assistant who actually opened what became Rathouse Hall at Queens College, CUNY in New York City. Rathouse Hall was the home of the music department. Mm -hmm. And that music department, I only recently found out, was sort of noted because Luigi Dalla Piccolo's students were part of the matrix of that. So I grew up hearing names like Dalla Piccolo, but I also grew up hearing about and, and knowing Saul Novak and uh, John Castellini and Leo Kraft and Boris Schwartz and all, all of that kind of interregnum generation of American composers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so that also influenced you know, me as a child. Um, my piano teacher, my mother actually, this individual spoke at my mother's funeral or memorial because she didn't have a funeral, she had a memorial, uh, Joel Mandelbaum. Mm -hmm who was, um, my mother got him his job. She, he was a grad student and I had applied for a job and my mother was one of those kind of administrative people who was always a little probably nosy and pushy. I come by it naturally. <laughs> and um, at some point he had applied for a job, something had happened. And I remember my mother at some point called him and said, come right back. You must apply for this. This is here and it's yours, you know. And he did and he got the job and remained at Queens College and at some point was actually head of the Academic Senate and everything, but he became my piano teacher. Yeah. 
I at some point was um, good enough uh, on piano to have auditioned for the High School of Music and Arts and been accepted in piano. I went to performing arts. I wasn't accepted in piano there. I don't think, I think I got the first audition, but not the second one. But I've always loved the piano. I have not played in years, but that's part of the, the kind of musical background. Now, here's another thing you may not know was as part of that music department, um, people used to get what were called score desk seats. The music department would get a raft of score desk seats every, um, every opera season. And this is back in the old yellow brick brewery, <laughs> the old men. Mm -hmm. um, and the score desks were all the way up in the gods. <laughs> And they were little tiny, literally desks where you could open the score, follow the score and listen to the opera. And they were there. They were sitting in the office. People didn't use them. People, mm -hmm. you know, some occasionally a student would come and get them or something. But my mother said, you know, I'm going to try those. So she'd haul, you know, I, I come from an extremely nuclear family, mommy, daddy, baby. And so the three of us would go climb all the way up to the top of, of the Met and peer down and listen to and see brief snippets of whatever the opera was. So I grew up with opera. And then when the Lincoln Center opened, my parents, who were culture vultures, extremely aspirational, but also very much um, in love with classical music and classical things, had subscriptions to the Met, the Philharmonic, the chamber music, and the ballet. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I had parents who had subscriptions to all of those things, so I was exposed to all of them. I remember the Young People's Musical Concerts with Bernstein, you know, Peter and the Wolf and all such mm -hmm. as that, and, you know, the Carnival of the Animals. And that's kind of how I grew up in music. So I'm going to interrupt just because we have an international audience and I want to give them some background on some of what you said. Please. In New York City, we had what was called the High School of the Performing Arts, which was on 46th Street. And we had the High School of Music and Art, which was on 135th Street. I auditioned and got into music and art, but my parents who were in the arts were mortified that I would go into the arts and they pleaded with me to go to a more scientific school, which is what I did. I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry I didn't go to music and art. Performing arts is on West 46th Street, right in the theater district and was down the street from a newspaper called Variety, which was <laughs> survival of show business. And Variety, always covered everything happening on the main stem, as they call Times Square, including what was going on and who were the talented kids at performing arts. The schools later merged and became the LaGuardia School for the Performing Arts, I believe, right next to Lincoln Center as a high school. Um, Lincoln Center opened in 1962. The Metropolitan Opera opened in September of 1966 with Leontine Price and Justino Diaz in Samuel Barber's Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, I was performance manager at the New Met and we too had score desks. And the way it was done at that time is that you would apply to the Metropolitan Opera Guild if you were a student. And if you got a score desk seat, which was very, very little money, you would then go to the check room <coughs> and they would give you the score. Mm -hmm. And you would check out the score and leave an ID and then go all the way up and sit at the score desk with the little lamps where students would read the score. And this continues to this day. And it's a wonderful element of the Met that not every theater has. And many people I know and now, including Jessica, um, began with the Met by being at the score desks and this is how we perpetuate and, and pass on the traditions of music. Um, Absolutely. The Met, I mean, it's a fascinating subculture of a subculture that I could talk about for decades, but there are all these details to that institution and, and you've raised one of them. Um, well, I have one other thing to add about yeah. the High School of Performing Arts for your international audience. People may not know the school, but they may have seen either the film or the television show, Fame which was based on the High School of Performing mm -hmm. Arts. So it's that school. 
Now, there's and, something else I want to ask you about, Jessica, that um, you and I mentioned once years ago in passing, but I've always wanted to ask you more. If I'm correct, you went to the United Nations International School. Absolutely. Would you talk about that? Because I had a different relationship with that institution, but I want to hear yours first and then chime in. <laughs> and then you'll tell me yours. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, gosh. It started out basically as a childcare issue. Um, one of the reasons that my parents were able to do things was that my mother worked. So she wasn't a stay at home mom, she was a working mother. And so I went to school from a very early age. I first went to a nursery school, uh, you know, sort of like a creche, a, child, a kindergarten, literally. And then I went to uh, the United Nations International School from literally pre-kindergarten through, um, through junior high school. And so, um, so I grew up in an international world and that's probably another valent of my musical likings. Um, I grew up, and I think if I've been told, I, you know, I have never really investigated it, but I've been told that I was the first non-UN child to go to the UN school. So I went at a time before it became just a New York City, you know, sort of private school, but when it was really very international in its, um, in its scope and in, you know, in its attendees and in its parents. And they did all sorts of things. We had international suppers and would play that games. That was where I wanted to go. What did you eat at that school? <laughs> well, we and we would play games at these international suppers. You know, it was sort of like potluck. The parents would bring the foods of their cultures. And, you know, we would do things that, you know, we thought were oh so innovative, like, um, you know, eat pasta, which wasn't called pasta, which was called spaghetti back then, with chopsticks. Who knew? We hadn't <laughs> had no knowledge of the noodle traditions of Asia, you know, but we did things like that. Um, my different friends, uh, you know, sort of acquainted me at, at children, childhood birthday parties. I would go to Danuta's house. Danuta was Danuta Malinowska, and she was from Poland. Poland so we yeah, would have yeah. Polish food at her house. I still remember just the tactile sensation. Um, my friends, Jennifer and Susan Unsworth were twins, but their mother had uh, soup spoons, sort of tablespoons with an incised bowl. So it was sort of rough on your tongue. I will never forget that. And they always had lovely shortbread cookies and mm. things of that sort. Um, Shika Dalal and Vasundra Narayanan were from um, Chennai, no, let's get it right, from Calcutta, mm -hmm. Calicut, and Chennai respectively, Calcutta and Madras back in those days. And so their parents would serve the foods of those places, very, very different foods. Um, you know, so I grew up, again, if I was a musical omnivore, I was probably a culinary omnivore as well. And then at home, I was at the intersection of two very different African-American traditions, sort of hard scrabble South, which would have been my father's side of the family, you know, eating greens and chitlins and, you know, hog maws and things of that sort. And my mother's family, which was from Roanoke, Virginia, which was very much Virginia food in the kind of Edna Lewis um, roasts and pickles and, you know, kind of. Tell us, I, I knew her, but tell things. us who Edna Lewis was. No, I know. I didn't think you had to, but. No, but I mean, I want you to tell our audience. Oh, oh, was. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Edna Lewis was a grand dame of African-American cooking. She um, was born and I believe raised in a place called Freetown, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of her her background, she was sort of self-taught. She was a very interesting individual because she, she came to New York and had a variety of jobs. And I'm not a biographer of uh, Edna Lewis, so this is going to be very brief, but had a variety of jobs. And one of them ended up being a cook at the Cafe Luxembourg. Yep. Cafe Luxembourg being a kind of bohemian place um, 
in the 50s, East 50s of Manhattan. And there she cooked the dishes of her youth and childhood. And they were, you know, quite simple, but well done with fresh ingredients. She, she was way before her time in that she was certainly a grand partisan of local, locally grown, not stuff that's being sourced from, you know, other parts of the world. Um, seasonal, eating according to the seasons and fresh, you know, not a lot of preserved things unless you've done the preserving, not a lot of, um, you know, canned goods or frozen goods or things of that sort. And remember now we're talking probably an era when frozen goods are still very much in vogue. So that she is flying against the traditions and doing these very simple, slightly Frenchified or French inspired in some ways, dishes that are just delicious mm -hmm. and serving them to the kind of the intelligentsia, the bohemian set, if you will, of New York City. I mean, I think Tennessee Williams was a, a partisan and a, a you know, a, a denizen, if you will, mm -hmm. of uh, Cafe Luxembourg and so on and so forth. So over the years, she grows in fame. She is taken on by cookbook editor, the legendary cookbook editor, Judith Jones, who also edited um, Julia Child, Julia who is Child, a yeah. totemic name in the United States, but not that well known abroad. So um, she is taken on by the preeminent cookbook editor and does several books with her and becomes very well known as, you know, this person who is a leading light of African-American food and um, moves on to cook in a variety of other places, including Gage and Tallner in New York City. In Brooklyn, it, which is an historic restaurant. It's one of the oldest restaurants. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I have friends in New Orleans who refer to Gage and Tallner as New York's Galatoires. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a classic restaurant in the Delmonico mode, almost. It has um, uh, had an extensive menu. There were a variety of choices. Um, it was in a building that was so old, it, was, it still had gas lights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were all kinds of amazing things. The waiters had sort of like hash marks that they would wear for the number of years that they had been there. And she went in there and added some of her Phillips to the menu and you know, continued to cook the Delmonico menu as well, but had this particular style of Southern cooking, this sort of slightly French influenced, but very locavore cooking that she espoused and that she, she sort of served. Um, she then went, I think after that, she went down to, um, to South Carolina, cooked at Middleton Plantation, cooked at Horseradish Grill, I think in Atlanta for a while, to a variety of places and then retired from cooking mm -hmm. and, um, you know, went on to glory. Yeah. <laughs> how she got over. Said, how she got over. She got um, over. I want to take you back to the UN because when I discovered that about you many years ago, we never really had this talk about it. Um, the UN, I did not go to the United Nations School, was profoundly influential in my development too because living in New York City means that we have delegations from every nation in the world, mm -hmm. from the, you know, from France and Japan to the tiniest little African nation or Paraguay or, you know, it, you name it, they're here, right. Bhutan. <laughs> you know. And it means that those delegations have cooks and often these cooks would then stay in New York and open a restaurant so that we as young people and now had the possibility if we were adventurous to go and find the cuisine of all these different countries. And we school children, I was in New York City public schools, were taken to the UN to learn about its, <coughs> excuse me, its history and then its role in the world and the good ideals of the UN. And there was a gift shop. <laughs> and I was eight years old and we went into the gift shop and the very first cookbook I ever bought was the United Nations cookbook. Oh my. And really? I still have it. And 
what was particular about it was that the chefs or the cooks from all of these countries would give a recipe or two. Mm -hmm. And number one, I started learning about countries that I'd never heard of, but number two, about ingredients. And I remember specifically Libya in North Africa had cassava, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what cassava was. So I went to a local market and asked, do you have cassava? I have a recipe for cassava that I want to work with. And they said, no, we don't have it. But if you go uptown to Harlem, there's a shop that has cassava. And this beautiful little softback book took me all over New York City in the exploration of the foods of the world. And I think it's wonderful that you were able, through your classmates, to discover their different cuisines. That, I mean, if I have to list the books that changed my life and, and give you five or six, in the food re repertory, that would be the one. Mm. And I, I treasure it. I don't know if the book is still in print, I but no it, it so opens the mind to realize that the foods that we make wherever we live are not the only foods in the world. Uh, yeah. Something that you and I share profoundly is our fascination for how ingredients travel. I always say that every um, food has a birth certificate and a passport. Mm -hmm. And you and I years ago were talking about rice and you corrected me, which I'm grateful for, that I was not aware that rice grew in West Africa. Well, there's certainly an African variant of rice, but even before we get to rice, the thing that would be interesting nowadays would be the whole notion that Libya introduced you to cassava Mm -hmm. because cassava is a new world <laughs> ingredient, yeah. not yeah. an old world ingredient. So it's another one of those things that would have had a passport to get to Libya. So there's, there's all of that, that sort of ebb and flow of foodstuffs, the way that things move and change. And, you know, Jessica, I'm going to ask you because diet. you do this really well. I do it pretty well, but you do it really well. <laughs> I wouldn't Explain bet on <laughs> how a food might be born in one place, but take root in another and how that happens and why sometimes when it arrives in the new place, I'll name one, chocolate in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, um, that perhaps it's better than where it was born and how that happens. Well, cacao is something that I am totally not expert on. You're going to have to ask okay. Maricel Precia on that. Yeah. But we could take something, again, like the rice that you mentioned earlier. What's interesting about rice is that there are two main types of rice. There is oriza sativa, which is the rice that we're all familiar with, the Asian rice. But there's also oriza glabirima, which is a rice that is native to the African continent. And just as in a sort of an apostrophe and a professorial parenthesis, wild rice is not rice. So that's right. why we're not talking about wild rice. It's a grain of some sort that's used as rice, but it is not rice as a cultivar. Um, so what happens with the um, oriza sativa, oriza glabirima confusion is that the people in that part of Africa, that if you look at Africa as sort of somebody with their arm on their elbow, that under part of the elbow there, which was sometimes called the rice coast, mm. um, you find that in uh, lower Senegambia, which would be uh, the part of the Senegal that's called the Casamance and the Gambia, uh, very much a colonial construct with this tiny little strip of British colony engulfed by French colony, mm -hmm. all of which was African empire prior to that. But if you look at that area of Senegal, if you go then down into Guinea, and uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, you'll find these rice growing areas. Um, in the rice growing areas, there were various different ways of, well, not various, but a very specific method of growing rice that was perfected. It was grown as a flood rice with dikes and, you know, bolts and, you know, channels and ways to flood and to, to regulate the water and so on and so forth flash forward to the very bad years of the transatlantic slave trade, the very bad centuries of the transatlantic slave trade. 
and uh, on this side of the Atlantic, um, rice becomes the the major commodity in the what 17th, 18th century South Carolina. So that you're getting um, you're getting people who are beginning to grow rice, but who have absolutely no idea of what to do or how to do it. Somebody has the brilliant idea that there are people on the African continent who know how to do this and who in fact do this very well. And so the taking, kidnapping, you know, uh, the vocabulary fails me of thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of Africans enslaving them, Africans from those rice growing regions, enslaving them and bringing them to the new world is what brought rice culture, not just to the Carolinas, but to places like Trinidad, well, actually Tobago, to um, Northeastern Brazil, Northern Brazil, to the state of Maranhão, to places in Haiti. I've been in Haiti, fell asleep in a car, woke up and, you know, had a moment because I'm looking at rice fields mm -hmm. and rice fields that look very much as though they might have been in my head somewhere in Asia at that point in my life and time. But so this whole notion of rice in this hemisphere is all driven by that, by that grain with a passport, as you said. So that's kind of how it works. So would the rice grown in the Americas be the African variant and not the Asian variety? That's still being discovered, actually. Um, currently, and I just had this confirmed for me a couple of nights ago, there seems to be, and I say seems to be because there's always somebody who got something in their backyard you don't know is growing there, but there is no glabirima growing in the United States now. Now, whether it has grown here previously and disappeared, whether it was grown, taken away, and I think that is the case, um, there's none growing here now. Um, but that's about all sorts of other, you know, industrial things that happened. It was, it was a grain that was very much um, prized. And it was a grain that became in its own way rebellion growing it was rebellion and so there's there's a much much deeper and more convoluted history that i don't have at the tip of my tongue so i'm not going to go into because somebody will write in and go you told a lie and i will have but it will have been inadvertent so i'm going to keep from lying inadvertently <laughs> did you know that rossini wrote an aria called the rice aria no yeah um the aria is actually called Di Tanti Palpiti. It's a beautiful aria that I think Marilyn Horn sings better than anyone else, but many people do it really well. And he called it the rice aria because he said he wrote it in the time that it would take him to, to make a risotto. Ah, so he okay. calculated he probably was, you know, writing with one hand and cooking with the other. Sir, sir, and sir. So he called it Lare del Riso, the rice aria. And I'll is send it, you a link on, on Adagio of Marilyn Horn singing Di Tanti Palpiti. And I always associate that aria with rice now. Oh, absolutely. That. that makes sense. Question, um, yeah. is it an aria in an opera? And which opera? It is. I believe it's Tancredi. I, I just, I remember it as rice aria. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's Tancredi. You okay. Know, there will be people write it to me. Well, I know, I know. Well, I'm pretty sure it's Tancredi. My new excuse is I'm old. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I don't have to remember everything. <laughs> um, while we're on the subject of rice, I didn't plan to go there, but there's a woman I wanted to ask you about um, who you knew and I met, and I imagine you knew her very well, whose name was Leah Chase. <laughs> and I can tell you, because I'm good on dates, exactly when I met her. Uh, it was August 29th, 1985. And this was my first visit to New Orleans. And I was working with the Metropolitan Opera, and I just had a little time gap to do a trip, and I had never been to New Orleans. I've been back since, but this was the first time. 
and I stayed at a rooming house on Charter Street in the old quarter. And I met a woman there who was local who said, I want you to meet someone I think you'll like and she'll like you. Her name is Leah Chase and she has a restaurant called Dookie Chase. And I'm going to take you there for breakfast. Now, Jessica, you know me to know that I'm not a morning person. Well, we share but, that. <laughs> but this woman said to me, honey, you really want to taste Leah's breakfast. So I did. I roused myself and got there at about eight in the morning. And it ranks in the top three breakfasts I've ever eaten. Because the sausage she made, she made it herself. Mm -hmm. uh, the eggs were gorgeous and she prepared them beautifully. And she made something called Kalas, which to me was Maria Kalas, C-A-L-L-A-S. <laughs> right. And I don't think Leah knew Maria Kalas at that time. Maybe she did. But you never knew were, who she knew. <laughs> but that's yeah. true. Um, but they were sort of. Oh, I know what they are. A rice latke. Well, I want our listener to know. Uh, a rice not a patty but a pancake but not quite and it had was it cinnamon or nutmeg in there it could have been cinnamon yeah um, they it was are... glorious so i you know i remember this wonderful woman all those years later she lived a very very long life and yes yes she's... and in fact january 6th would have been her 99th birthday ah okay and she went on to national fame which she deserved and she was very important in the civil rights movement. She was very important in New Orleans recovery from Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about Leah Chase? Because I know you knew her and she was a great figure. Oh my goodness. I don't even know where to start. Uh, I guess I should start by saying, um, Leah Chase was a Capricorn. As I said earlier, her birthday was January 6th. My mother was also a Capricorn. Her birthday was January 18th. I introduced them to each other and they became fond friends. Mm -hmm. Not for that long a period of time, but whenever my mother would go to New Orleans to visit me, they would get together and they had their own little shorthand. They'd get together, fuss about what their husbands had done, would do, might do, uh, talk about food, talk about music, talk about art. And about six months after my mother died, um, I was in New Orleans and not in a good place. And Leah Chase sort of looked at me and said, well, Jessica, I've decided I'm going to take you on. Hmm. And it's like, take me on. Yeah, I've decided that you're mine. And that kind of was it. You know, I, from that day until the day she died, called her Aunt Leah. Um we had adventures. I would go to New Orleans. I never had a trip to New Orleans where I didn't go to the restaurant. And in fact, on Tuesday of last week, I was literally flying out of New Orleans Tuesday evening, but I went and had lunch on Tuesday because I still make a, a pilgrimage, if you will, to, um, to Dookie's to, to pay homage. To, to her and to that extraordinary family. It was not her, it was her husband's family restaurant. It wasn't hers. And it started out as a little sandwich shop on Orleans Avenue in New Orleans. And she transformed it into uh, a white tablecloth and the preeminent African-American white tablecloth restaurant in a city that's noted for its restaurants. And she was very, very, very good at what she did. She grew up in Madisonville, if I'm not mistaken, Louisiana, which is out in the country. She uh, was basically a country girl. She grew up eating um, foods that her father had hunted and her family had grown and so on and so forth. She, if I'm not mistaken, came into New Orleans as a young girl to, to continue school. And then after school, worked in a variety of jobs. And she had some interesting jobs. She once managed prize fighters, if you can imagine. <laughs> so she was an interesting, interesting woman. But um, she ended up at a place, I believe, called the Coffee Pot. I could be wrong about that, yeah. in the French Quarter, cooking. Yeah. And there she... Um, 
she fell in love with with food, with cooking. With, it was her way of showing love. You know, she might not be able to say, you know, I really, really care for you, but she'd send you a plate of food that would let you know that that was the case. And so she, when she met uh, Dookie Chase, whose family had this little sandwich shop, um, they jointly and at, as family business moved it forward to being that place that now uh, when you go in there, you see a picture of two presidents. One is Barack Obama tying a napkin under his <laughs> neck so he can get ready to go face down in a bowl of gumbo. And the other one is um, George um, W. Bush. And she knew them both and they both ate there. And um, she chastised Obama because at one point, I think he was putting hot sauce or salt into one of her dishes before he tasted it. And it wasn't that she didn't want the hot sauce or the salt. It was, you have to taste it first. That's right. Um, you know, and she was very clear about that. She, she brooked she brooked very little, if any, stupidity mm -hmm. from anyone. Uh, you, you know, she had a, a dress rule, you know, no, no sort of string vests. No, you couldn't really wear a hat in the restaurant. It wasn't a, you have to wear a coat and tie thing, but it was, you must respect this place. And she was very, very good about that. Uh, the other thing was that um, on a little tiny easel, for many years was a letter from the Pope. She um, was devoutly Roman Catholic. And as many people in Louisiana are, a lot of as, people from Elkford don't know that Louisiana uniquely in the South has a very strong Roman Catholic Roman population. Catholic, exactly. And so, um, so those were kind of like her pillars, faith and family. And then out of that faith and family, she then went on to, to do all sorts of things. She would send food to the Freedom Riders. Um, a friend of mine whose grandmother was one of the Freedom Riders said, yeah, yeah, no, we didn't get to eat in the restaurant. She just sent the food to us when we were in jail. You know? so Jessica, but, please briefly define Freedom Riders. I absolutely okay, know what it is, freedom, but I want our listeners to know. Freedom Riders back in... I guess it's the 1960s. Mm -hmm, 65. Uh, okay, were people who came from the North for the most part, interracial, not all black, not all white, but people who came down to ride the buses that had been segregated, but also they came down to, to test the laws, to test the, um, the segregation laws, to see how things you know, to push the barriers, to push the boundaries is a better way of doing it. Um, they came down fully expecting to be arrested in many cases and went off to, to do these extraordinary things. And, um, and when they were arrested, and in fact, sometimes before they even started out on these journeys in these buses, Mrs. Chase would feed them. And then if they got arrested in the areas that were near where she could get food to them, she'd send them food, you know. And so she was very much involved in the civil rights movement then. But I think even more importantly, in the restaurant itself, there was an upstairs room that became a safe space in New Orleans. Because she was so highly respected in the community, um, she knew the police chief and they knew her and she probably knew the mayors and they knew her. And she was certainly a leader of the African-American community. Um, and at that point in time, it was illegal for blacks and whites to meet, to sit together, to, to certainly dine together. And so in this upper room of the restaurant, um, blacks and whites would meet to strategize, to strategize for the, um, for the freedom rides, for, for a variety of marches, for all sorts of things that were going on in the New Orleans area and beyond. Um, so, and they're getting ready to, they, they being the next generation of the Chase family, because it was 
uh, Dookie's father's restaurant, then Dookie and Mrs. Chase. Then now um, she had three daughters, two of whom survive and a son, and they are working. I guess they are the elders of the family now. And under them, there is another generation that is coming in um, that is making, making, you know, changes, not so many that it's unrecognizable, but that are bringing their, their new optique to the thing. But what they are doing, one of the things that they are doing in the restaurant is that they are renovating and restoring that upper dining room where people met as a sort of marker. You know, one of Mahalia Jackson's most famous songs was In the Upper Room. In the Upper Room with which Jesus. Which was about heaven. And um, Leah, because she knew of my passion for gospel music, would sing to me In the Upper Room. <laughs> and was, I, I mean, I knew the song and I'd sing it with her when we'd be at table in the morning. And by the way, her coffee was fabulous, too. Which is um, interesting because, you know, she never... Until the day she died, she'd never had a cup of coffee. It was something she did not drink. I know, but she knew how to make it. It was wonderful oh, yeah. coffee. Yeah. Also with Leah Chase, I explored a term that I came to learn a lot more about, which is a musical term. It's an African-American musical term. She referred to that upper room sometimes as the Hush Harbor. Do you know that term? I do. I do in the sense of a place of, well, I mean, it almost goes back to the Underground Railroad. Yeah. I mean, but also whole... where music would be made, very specifically, the kind of music that African Americans back then could not perform or make in public, they would do in rural outdoor places that they would call the Hush Harbor where they would evolve music and so many of the musical forms that right. are at their roots African-American in the United States were born in these hush harbors. And she said to me, I think of that room as my hush harbor. Absolutely, I love that. absolutely. Love that. No, but with the hush harbor, you also get the idea of the music that is created in silence in a way. Yes. Um, and that is not just, it's African-American in the hemispheric sense, not just African-American in, um, in the United Statesian sense, if you will, because with hush harbors or with things that are similar to the African-American United States hush harbors, you'll find um, ways of, of quietly clapping, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, candomblé houses in Brazil and ceremonies that take place absolutely in silence until at some point the silence is broken. Um, but all of these going back to that kind of almost, since you were such a lover of, of gospel and spiritual, steal away. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about that kind of music where you have to steal away. Yeah. You don't rush out. You, it's, right. it's, it's done in quiet, it's hush. And so all of that is a part of it as well. Jessica, do you know why in the 1950s in New York there was born a tradition of people in audiences snapping when they liked music? Do you know how that was born? I don't know how it was born, but I remember being at a place called L'Abbaye in Paris. Yes. With Gordon Heath mm -hmm. and with the proverbial nuclear family that I was just telling you about, Mommy, Daddy, Baby, on our first trip to Europe, my father somehow or other knew Gordon Heath. And we ended up going to this club, which was really on a street right behind Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And it was this little teeny tiny bohemian jazz club. And you had to snap your fingers instead of applaud. What? And I have no idea why. Well, I'll tell you why. Because these, let's call them hush harbors in Greenwich Village and, and Harlem, but especially in Greenwich Village in New York City, the musicians who would make unamplified music um, were doing it in places where you were not allowed to perform music. Uh -huh. So the audience was told, um, don't applaud, don't cheer, but if you like it, snap. So okay. the tradition of snapping was kind of like for people who cannot hear doing this as applause mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. indicate to the musician that they were appreciating what they were experiencing, or actor, That's 
what they were experiencing. Um, this brings me to France and you because um, you were a French major. You you studied French speaking theater in Senegal and West Africa. Paris has been a huge part of your formation because we have someone who was a New Yorker who went to the international school who has explored the various exchanges along the Atlantic between Africa and the Americas. But there is also the French influence, I would think. And perhaps, and you tell me your way of looking at the world, to what degree was it formed by any kind of French sensibility? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I think my way of looking at the world is kind of international in many ways. But I think that um, one of the things that I am aware of is speaking, and you would know this as well, you, you have, you are always you, but you have slightly differently nuanced personalities in different languages. Yes. You know, I am a little more playful and flirtatious, I think in French, because I like You're pretty good in them. English. <laughs> I, 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 I get along. I, get, I, I, I ain't bad, but I'm a little better at it in French, I think. Okay. So I mean, so one of the things that's interesting about that is that um, that it's another way of of forming things, another way of looking at things. I know that a lot of times, particularly when I write, there's a whole kind of classical French way you do your thesis, your antithesis, and then your synthesis. Uh, thèse, antithèse, synthèse. And it was a, a form, a style, basically, that, that you had to learn. I have a degree from a French university. I have a licence S lettre from Université de Nancy. And in, with actually a mention assez bien, which is sort of <laughs> damned with faint praise. But... Um, My but, would be more pas mal. <laughs> yeah, well, that pretty much. Um, but... Um, you know, good enough, assez bien, you know, thanks. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the thing is that, that all of that study in those modes then forms you another kind of way. Um, I also had a very, not necessarily classical in the sense that I studied the classics, but a classically based liberal arts education in the United States. I went to Bryn Mawr and it's one of the seven sister colleges. And I went at a point in time when, when you were, you, you, you know, you had not only one language, but two to graduate. You had to take, we, I took rocks for jocks cause I was not a scientist, <laughs> but you know, you had that kind of rounded background that um, a, as well as the major that I don't think occurs in quite the same way anymore. And so I think all of those things are also a part of, um, you know, what forms me intellectually, if you will, as well as the UN school. And then there is, that's one side, if you will, the other side, and they're both valence of me, the other side would be very much the African side. And that side was certainly learned um, on the ground in the various countries that I visited over the time that I visited there in the, um, you know, in the homes of my friends where, you know, I do something and they say, mm, no, that's not how we do that and mm -hmm. school me. So it was a whole nother kind of upbringing, learning how to, how to be appropriate in those cultures as well, learning how to, to respect elders, learning how to, uh, to shop in a market, learning how to eat at table, all of those things, very much a part of that side of the schooling. So that it's, it's a crazy mix, but it's mm -hmm. mine. I, I asked about France in part because you and most people associate me with Italy, which is absolutely correct. Uh, that's from most of my formation happened outside of New York. But I have also deeply been attached to France 
And the nice thing about France and especially Paris for me is that <laughs> I don't have many friends in France. I have just a few. <laughs> Whereas I have many in the Great Britain and Germany and Austria and Italy, the United States and so on and Scandinavia. But um, somehow either I didn't pursue friendship or it just didn't happen. And the great thing for me in Paris is I'm absolutely unencumbered by obligation. Uh. And I lived there, I was a student there when I was 20, which is very formative. And I lived in a very, rundown place that I adored, very La Boheme. And my landlady was a French woman and her husband was Egyptian. And when often I didn't have enough money for food, they would give me a, a bowl of whatever he was cooking because he was the cook in the house. And I loved the entire experience, but what I loved especially in Paris was the rationality of things, or let's say a different way of thinking about daily living than I encountered in Italy or anywhere else. And it made perfect sense to me. Mm. And something about the underlying values of privacy and culture and freedom, which we can articulate often in the United States and other places, somehow they were quietly lived at least in the milieu that I was in in Paris. Uh, I was also chastised for not giving a tip to the barman um, who banged his little plate when I, he said service, service, when I didn't put a, a centime down uh, having my coffee. And by the way, Jessica, coffee in France, I love France, but coffee is terrible. <laughs> and one of the reasons I discovered is that in Italy, the blend is a combination of mostly Arabica, which is East Africa, and a bit of Robusta, which is West Africa, whereas the French have a much higher proportion of robusta, robusta in their coffee and it's a little too woody and harsh for me it's a nice blending coffee but um i grew up more with the arabica taste and then there's the whole issue of roasting but that's for another another <laughs> another back. conversation yeah but france has really formed me a lot and you know you and i never really spoke about france or about italy about my you know other home and but when we have a different language and a different culture and a different way of relating to people that's based on the language and the culture, it always lives in a mirror kind of form to, I, I mean, I don't feel conflicted about my identity, but I understand that there are parts of me that Americans just don't get because they relate to that other world. And you too in your formation in many African countries and families and cultures. And I think it's important to say, and you can say it better, that Africa is not monolithic. There are 53 or 54 countries and many languages and oh, Lord, topographies yeah. and foods and so on and high mountains and deserts and oceans and everything in and between, forests, yeah. everything. So Africa is not monolithic. Jessica, there's a question I want to ask you that I have broached with a couple of friends from Africa that is a delicate question, but it's meant in the most loving way. Many people that I have known from Nigeria and Ghana specifically have gorgeous voices, really just whether it's in the DNA or whatever, but among the most beautiful voices I've known anywhere from Nigeria and Ghana. And because so many people from that part of Africa were enslaved and brought to America, I've always wondered the degree to which that beautiful voice DNA has entered the voices of many Black people in America. And the degree to which music and vocal expression has the benefit of having those gorgeous voices to begin with some of these people in America went on to sing opera, others, every other kind of musical form, some of them being gorgeous, eloquent speakers who marry not just their words and their rhetoric, but the gorgeousness of the way, the cadence. Dr. Martin Luther King had this gorgeous baritone voice. His wife, Coretta, was an opera singer. I don't know if you know that. I did know that. Uh, yeah, Coretta studied in Boston and Dr. King went to... In fact, they met in Boston. Boston, did they not? Yeah. 
and he went to woo her there and mm -hmm. you know he had to learn opera to please the woman he wanted to marry so am i off course in wondering well, I, about I, voices honestly i'd never thought about it um i don't know about the languages of ghana but i know that uh yoruba is a tonal language so i think the whole idea of speaking a tonal language may may bring something to it i think there's also possibly and then these again are gross generalizations that have no basis in anything other than conjecture at least as far as i'm concerned um but um but I would suspect that that whole idea is very important. I know that um, people of the Jewish faith are often called people of the book. I contend that African-Americans certainly and many of the West Africans from whom we are descended are people of the word. Mm -hmm. It has been my good fortune to have been in Senegal on several occasions at election time and how one speaks, how one puts together words, how one manipulates and plays with language is very important at election time. People, people listen in another kind of way. I think that that is is very much a part of things. I remember once eons ago seeing a play by Shoyenka at, um, I think it was at Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. and being struck by a directorial decision, which was, it was all done in very sort of Shakespearean terms. And I thought to myself, no, 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 that is not working. What it should have been was in the cadences of the Black church. I mean, I think that the, the righteous rhythms, if you will, and the righteous rhetoric of the African-American church are, um, are still soul stirring, quite simply, uh, and quite literally. I think that that whole um, way of wordplay, we have Amanda Gorman, that wonderful young oh. poet who spoke at the Biden inauguration. And if you listen to her, if you listen to a lot of young African-American spoken word artists, you get that same love of cadence and playfulness with language. So I think that you're not off track about that running as a thread through. What to attribute it to, I have no idea. But I do think that there is a love of the word and an importance of the word in, uh, in certainly many of the African-American communities that I'm familiar with. Speaking of words and speaking and then for a period not speaking, you were a friend of Dr. Maya Angelou, who this week is yes. being honored. I believe she's the first Black American woman to appear on a coin. They're mm -hmm. releasing a series of quarters, and she's the very 25 cents, and she's the very first one. Absolutely. Um, her birthday, I told you, you know my thing with dates, was April 4th, which was the day that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember hearing her speaking, I was in the audience very eloquently about the experience of turning 50 the day that he was killed mm. and how she associated after that fact april 4th with both her birth and her rebirth as she called it but also of his death and what it meant as a nation um she's very famous i would love for you to talk about the woman you knew as opposed to the famous figure wow well i mean i think one of the things that was or that is, if you will, interesting to me about my knowledge of Dr. Angelo is that I was allowed to call her Maya. Possibly, I suspect, because she recognized that I had been there tangentially, but there 
in her life when she was Maya, before she became Dr. Angela. And I knew Maya Angelou for more than 40 years. So that's a fairly long span. And she got to see me in, in 40 years of my varying and sundry iterations as well. She basically got to see me grow up. Um, and so we had a relationship that sort of morphed and changed and evolved as, as we each reached different, different stages. Um, we shared a lot of things. Um, we shared a love of good friends, some of whom we shared. We shared a love of good company and entertaining and doing all of that well. But I think most importantly, we shared a love of good food. Mm -hmm. um, she was an extraordinary cook, loved to cook. And um, cooking in some cases for her was personal, but in other cases it could almost be performance. I remember the first time I ever was in a kitchen where she was preparing food was in, um, I guess she had a house in, uh, in California, I think it was Sonoma. And um, I went there with, with a friend who had been her friend. So I was, I was the tag along. And at that point she was preparing a dinner for us and it was quite elaborate. Um, it was, um, a dinner that was, uh, I've forgotten how many boys, curry, uh, sort of a kind of Indonesian rice stafel. Here we are back on the topic of rice with a rice table. But the idea was that as the rice stafel, there were X number of boys and the boys simply, as she explained it, represented the number of servants who would carry the condiments that would accompany the curry. So you had a 10 boy curry or an eight boy curry or whatever it was. Um, but she was preparing this in her, in her kitchen. And as I remember it, the kitchen was sort of open. I don't know why I remember a fireplace. I don't think there was a fireplace in the kitchen, but there may have been a fireplace adjacent to the kitchen. Cause I remember that at some point she, um, she actually took a handful of lavender buds and put them on the um, the shovel that's part of the you know the andiron fireplace thing, and um, burned that, which gave a wonderful sort of lavender scent to the air. So it was a totally all senses at work culinary experience, and it was very performative in this case. Um, you know, she was conscious that I was watching. Uh, this was, as I said, probably one of the first, if not the first time I'd ever been in her presence to watch her cook. And it was, um, you know, it was almost theater. I mean, there she, she would sing, she would dance, she, you know, it was, it was a performance. It was something that was Breathtaking and awe-inspiring, to say the least. Remember, at this point, I'm probably somewhere in my 20s. And, you know, it's like, oh, my Lord, where, where am I? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. And, um, and that morphed and gradually changed. The last time I was with her cooking was probably a couple of months before she died. Mm -hmm. And I was at her home in Winston-Salem. And at that point, she was ill, tethered to an um, oxygen tank because she had um, breathing issues and um, was simply giving instructions. She was making, I think it was a chicken salad, but um, she would ask her assistant, you know, get this and she put it together and taste it. No, 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 it needs some of that, go get that. And she put it in. And so all of that, so it was, it was that range of experience of her cooking. And um, one of my great honors was 
she would call me from time to time and say, you know, I'm thinking about making fill in the blank. What would you do? What, what, do you have a recipe for that in one of your books? What would you put in here? How do we do that? And so we really kind of had a, a 40, 30 year relationship, at least of, of, you know, sort of kitchen companionship. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was always, always quite wonderful, you know, but she was, she was extraordinary. I, um, I remember when I found it out that she was going to be on the quarter, just a, it was only a couple of days ago, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. um I reached out to her assistant, uh, her former personal assistant, whom I haven't heard from. I've got to call her and see what's up. But and said, you know, because she wrote that amazing poem, Still I Rise, I said, and she's still rising. You know, she's still rising. And then the other person that I wrote to and I have heard from was um, James Baldwin's sister-in-law. And huh. she you know, she sort of acknowledged and said, yes, she is. You know, we were both gleeful together. So that was good. Did you ever know my very beloved friend, Carol Field, magnificent food writer, who specialized in Italy and her most famous book of all of her wonderful books. And if people don't know Carol Field, I want you to go out and find Carol's books in addition to Jessica's books, was called The Italian Baker. And it's just the perfect book, so much so that although she was from California, most Italians use the Italian baker as (laughs) their source book for knowledge of their own baking traditions. And she and I were once joking about what we would have on our tombstones. And for Carol, given that she was a baker, I said, let rise. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. There you go. Um, Because I'm being mindful of our time and there are things I want to talk to you about still, but I wanted to bring in one top two things. You were talking about listening and I made very few notes for our conversation because I didn't need it, but I wrote Jessica in my experience is a great listener. Talk about listening as opposed to speaking. You're a great speaker, but you are also a really terrific listener and not everyone is. Well, thank you. Thank and you. apply that also to music if you would. Um, Many, many years ago, um, a college classmate of mine, uh, Drew Gilpin Faust, who was the former president of Harvard. <laughs> Bren Mawr always jokes that when Harvard had to get a president, it went to Bren Mawr. We <laughs> thought that was funny. It still is. It's still wonderful. But uh, just before she became, or she ascended, if you will, to president of Harvard, she had been um, in charge of the Radcliffe seminars and she called a Radcliffe seminar that I think was on food or food and foodways or something of that effect. And, and I was, you know, as the British would say, gobsmacked when she asked me to speak. And I spoke about, um, people always ask about methodology and I always say, I'm not sure I have methodology, a methodology. I kind of go by the seat of my pants, but I, I did a presentation called Studying the Silences. And I think that's part of what listening is. Sometimes you learn as much from what isn't said as from what is said. Sometimes you find things in the silence that you don't necessarily hear in the noise. And I think that that's part of why I listen. Um, But I also think that that's part of what listening is. It's because conversations are not monologues. You know, it's um, conversation is not an aria. Mm -hmm. A conversation is a duet, Mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or multiples. But um, you're not, it's not a solo. You are in an exchange, a given exchange in African-American music. We often talk about call response. But you have to have the response as well as the call. So that I think that that's part of what listening is. Um, Those beats where there is no music in the music. 
is what makes the music. The composer put a rest there for a reason. And exactly. He, he, knew how long the rest should be and but then it's up to the musician to interpret that rest symbol to to rest only the appropriate amount of time um thank you for that and another thing i just wanted to flag for you and you and i can talk about this at length another time we've never discussed the fact that some of my very favorite food in the world i've had in the french caribbean <laughs> and i've not been to haiti but i've spent a lot of time in martinique and guadeloupe and saint bart's and the food is fantastic because it's to some degree local ingredients plus that which came from Europe and Africa, plus French cooking methods, uh, especially in Martinique. I think it's one of the great underrepresented cuisines of the world is Martinique. Talk about your feelings about French Caribbean cooking. Well, I actually haven't been back in a while and I may prefer... Guadeloupe, which is interesting. Okay. But no, 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 because the islands are slightly different. I have always thought of Martinique as being a tad more French mm -hmm. and Guadeloupe being a tad more African. And that may explain our divergence of opinion. Mm -hmm. But um, but they are both that sweet spot, for want of a better term, when you get sort of Africa and Europe coming together in the new world with all of the bounty of the new world and the traditions of the native peoples of the new world. So you've got all of those three things kind of coming together to create this very different and unique way of being for about, well, at least a decade, I was a member of something called the Association, Association des Cuisinières, and it was uh, it started out as a a mutual what do you call them mutual support um, you know mutual network mutual support network um, they used to call them burial societies in yeah. the African Atlantic world where people would get together they'd pay a small sum it was insurance when black folks couldn't get insurance. And this uh, Mutuel Cristo, which is one of the organizations, and then the Association des Cuisinières started out as, um, as those kinds of burial societies. And once a year, uh, certainly up until pandemic, possibly a little before, uh, the Association and the Mutuel would give what they call the Fête des Cuisinières, which is the Feast of the Women Chefs. And it's in Guadeloupe on the Saturday closest to St. Lawrence's Day. St. Lawrence being the patron saint of these two organizations. Why St. Lawrence? August 10th. Yep, but why St. Lawrence? You tell me, because, well, the shooting stars. Nah, nah, because he was martyred on the grill. Oh, <laughs> so and they they dress up in full Creole finery, you know, a grand robe Creole with massive amounts of gorgeous Creole jewelry, and they always have an apron, and on the apron is the grill for Saint Lawrence, and so um, so there was about five or six, maybe more years when I would go down every year and parade with them. They have it was an open to the public thing. They have a high mass at the uh, cathedral, and then um, go back. Well, at, at that point, they went back to like a schoolyard and had uh, a luncheon that was not always the greatest example of Creole food, but that was always the most wonderful time because you'd find some of these uh, cuisinières, these old women cooks who were in their 80s and 90s. And then one year there was one who was a centenarian and they play the begin, they dance, they drink mm. lots of rum. And by the end of the evening, sometimes it gets a little rude and raucous, <laughs> but it was always wonderful, just that sense of continuity. And then the love of food. I had a woman that I used to call my mom on Guadeloupe. She was like my Leah Chase for Guadeloupe. And... Um, Carmelita Jeanne, and she was sort of my my inroad to to that society and to that arena. But um, the food was just extraordinary, and the food 
goes back. I think that, that as I said, Martinique may be a little more formally French. Guadeloupe may be more rustically African, but the tastes are just amazing. Acra de Mouru. Uh, oh, I know, you know, I know. You know, those, <laughs> those lovely fried acra, the little tiny blood sausages. You're getting ready to make me think I might have to go downstairs and have a tea ponche at dinner time. You know, but that, also, I love guava and the use of guava in as a flavor uh, element in their cuisine is just extraordinary mm -hmm. because it's not overwrought. But some of the best yogurt I ever had was made in Martinique, but with oh, the yeah. addition of guava, it was fantastic. Yeah. So <laughs> to conclude, because you and I could talk forever, but and there are many topics we never got to, but that's OK. Um, you provided wonderful musical selections for our listeners <laughs> around the world. Um, numerous and all wonderful. Florence Price, I will sing her, single her out. Uh, a composer who is finally getting her recognition way too Hallelujah. late. Mm -hmm. Talk about Florence Price. I can't. I am okay. an <laughs> avid listener of WQXR. Our radio New station York. New York. Yep. Our classical radio station uh, was pre my discovering Idagio, but you know, I, um, I love QXR and about three or four years ago, pretty much after, um, after all of the kind of awareness of African American omissions, um, they started playing Florence Price and it was like, wow, I love this. I just mm -hmm. love this. There's a Juba dance, a celebration in the cane fields. There's just her eye on the life as she expressed it musically. It's yeah. just wonderful. So I commend that to listeners. You have wonderful singers such as Rary Grist, uh, Lantine Price, Jesse Norman. Uh, I added Leonie Riesenek because I thought you would like her. You wanted a, a version of Visi Darte from Tosca that you might right. not have known. And I think Leonie Riesenek fits the bill. Also because Leonie Riesenek, uh, when she was singing at the Met, was in a production that starred, not starred, that featured a very young singer making her Met debut named Martina Arroyo. <laughs> and Jessica and I both are friends of Martina, but we never really went into that. And when Martina was right. my guest on December 31st, after I said to her, you know, Jessica is joining me on January 14th. Martina had no clue that you and I are friends. Right. And so talk about Martina, the artist, but also Martina, the friend. Wow. I don't even know where to start. Um, I'm, I'm going to back up just a minute. I picked the artists. Jesse Norman, Leontine Price and Riri Grist, because I had met them all. Okay. I I met Leontine backstage at uh, one of her performances at the Met. I don't remember which one. Jesse Norman I met in Oxford one year. We, we were, were all together. Of the she Oxford. and I then taught a class on Richard Strauss after that at Oxford. Okay. That Wonderful. same year. Yeah. Wonderful. But that was the year I met her and we kind of bonded and mm -hmm. never got to really see a friendship come to fruition because she she passed, got over way too, yeah. or went over way too young. Yep. And Riri Grist, because at uh, part of my culmination of 50 years of teaching at Queens College was I was the Grand Marshal for commencement. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten what year. But that year was the year that Riri Grist was given an honorary doctorate because yeah. she's a Queens College graduate. So I met her and, you know, I think she may have gone through the music department when my mother was there, which brings this conversation back kind of full circle to me and music. But Martina Arroyo, gosh, I don't even know what to say about her. She's just been a wonderful presence. She has, she has an ability to, to giggle. <laughs> she, she, and then she, some. <laughs> well, I mean, she giggles well, and she is, she giggles about herself. She giggles 
about the world, which is not to say she is blindly or madly happy all the time, but it is to say that she is a presence that you want to be in. If you meet her, you want to know her better. Mm -hmm. um, I met her and in fact, many of the people that we have talked about through a gentleman who was in my life named Sam Floyd. Um, and um, we kind of ebbed and flowed. And then most recently in the past, um, I guess five to seven years, re-met her through um, a person whose name is going to escape me much to my great dismay, um, but who does opera on Martha's Vineyard mm -hmm. and who gives opera, you know, one weekend does wonderful opera. That's how I re-met Lisa. And then through Lisa, re-met Martina. And, um, and so with all of that, um, she's came back into my life and we have now again lots to reconnect on lots to talk about lots to think about i actually knew her mother i ah. don't know if you did as well but that's how long i've known oh, her I didn't. yeah no 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 i've known her long enough to have known her mother who was at points in my life when i needed a champion a great champion for me so i will always 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 honor that and Martina told me, I'm sorry to interrupt, that her mother and her father always insisted on bringing people into their home to feed them. I can believe that because mm -hmm. she does, too. Yeah. She does, too. I mean, we're all feeders. We're all eaters. We're all cooks. <laughs> um, we're all wordsmiths in our own ways. Um, you know, she is just that kind of incredible embodiment of, of the artist the artist as um, the artist who embodies her art in a way. And well, that gives me a wonderful outline to say that, uh, in other words, exit line, um, that you too are an artist who embodies your art. And Martina Arroyo has made life better for so many people everywhere. And so have you. And I say that both as your friend, but also as someone who has, watch you observe you in many situations where we're not together and engaged in our friendship but i see the impact that you have on people and how you move them and how you make them better and that's you know what we all want that's how we get over <laughs> thank you thank <laughs> so, you thank jessica you. thank you very very much and Everybody read Jessica's books. Pick whichever one you want. I named a few, but there are about a dozen at least. And uh, they're all terrific. So thank you, Jessica. See you soon. Thank you so much, Fred. Take yeah. care. This has been a great way to start a year.